But I don't just serve a cause. My cause is actually Christ. Because I read in the Bible where it says, Seek first the kingdom of heaven, and all these things will be added unto you. So for me, seek first the kingdom of heaven, and all of these children will be added unto you. I've found, uh, I've been doing this since I was 14, and I just turned 41. Huh. Um, didn't have a nervous breakdown yet over it, but um, but I came to Ireland the first time at 14, and they've been working on legalizing abortion. I remember even the, at that time, working away, working away, working away, working away at bringing abortion here. Uh, but in... In 27 years of doing this, I have found that the most, the, the way to be, the way to, to stand for truth and still be kind is to serve Jesus first and foremost. Uh, I think when we abandon that and we just serve a cause, we can also become as angry as our adversaries. And that I do not want to be. Um, I've had a quite, a quite an adventurous time in my first 48 hours back in Ireland. Yesterday was just astonishing. I found myself <laughs> standing in the middle of Dublin <laughs> streets telling the story that I'm about to tell you. And I thought, oh my gosh, oh my word, I'm standing in the middle of... <laughs> I'm doing this, I'm really doing this. Oh, my life. Uh, but I thank you so much for having me and for giving me the honor of coming and trying to defend your children. I found that uh, people that oppose me here despise when I use the word murder. How dare you use that language, I was told on the radio yesterday, classic rock FM. How dare you, said one of the callers. How dare you use that language? And I said, that is precisely your technique. You manipulate the language, and that is how you do it. You avoid calling things as they are, and therefore you manipulate the masses. So I will not give in to that. I've been through hell. I can take a little bit more. I just have one request, if I may, too, really. If you wouldn't mind silencing your phones, that would be fabulous. And number two, I love to greet all of you, and I will afterward. It's my favorite thing ever. But I would just ask that if you are carrying a virus, if you are cold, if you are sick in any way, if you are saying, I'm just getting over it, no, you are lying. All people are lying when they're saying that they're never getting over it. They're giving it away. <laughs> and I get sick very easily, so I would ask you to honor my boundary. Thank you. So I come from America, and uh, I'm adopted, and my biological parents were 17 years old. Uh, my biological mother was seven and a half months pregnant when she went to Planned Parenthood in Southern California. And I've had the honor of having Irish people tell me in the last 24 hours, you are a liar, you're lying, you're lying. And I thought, oh, how nice. My mother tried to murder me. How dare you use that language? <laughs> it doesn't matter that I survived being murdered and I live with cerebral palsy. No, 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 no. How dare you use that language? <laughs> People. Their hearts can grow so cold and hard, can't they? I find it interesting that radical feminists don't want to hear from me, and I'm getting back to the story, but let me just tell you, I differ from, from many other speakers in that I'm, I'm not extraordinarily structured. I just speak from the heart and then I'm finished. So, I hope you don't mind, and if you do, it'll be over mm, soon. But the radical feminists don't want to hear from me. They call me a liar. Even though I have medical records on my website that say born during saline abortion. April the 6th, 1977. 
6 a.m., two and a half pounds, 29 and a half weeks. You are completely irre um, irrelevant, Jonna. You don't even belong in Ireland. You are not Irish, and Irish women can make their own choices. Blah, 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 blah. blah. <laughs> but you say that you want every woman to be fully aware of her, of her, of her choices. You want her to be fully educated because she's vulnerable, and yes, she is. But then why don't you want to hear from someone who lived through the very atrocity that you say is such compassion and such caring and such kindness? Because it is you who are the liar. If you are advocating for the murder of children and you are calling it compassion, you are the one who is lying. And you are not for the empowerment of women. And to the great vexation of the feminists who never want to hear from me anyway, I say this. I can never be a feminist. You know why? Number one, to be a feminist today, you have to hate men. And I do not. I love men. I think they're fabulous. And by the way, women, we are not the only ones who are created in the image of God. Contrary to popular belief, men are as well. And masculinity is under assault. Feminists are always shouting about how we're victimized all the time. And yes, women have, at, in, in, obviously, been victimized in many different ways, in horrendous ways at times, but also it doesn't mean that every man is evil and just because a man is masculine does not make it, uh, masculinity is not equivalent with being a predator. What we are doing is wrong in this respect. We are destroying our men worldwide. And women, we will be held accountable for every man and every son and every friend that we destroy. We need our men to be men. And we need to let them be. So just think about that for a while. <laughs> so I'm sure they're loving me online at the moment. Um, so yesterday in Dublin, I shouted out in the middle of the street, the reason I cannot be a feminist is because a feminist has to consider herself a perpetual victim of something at all times. <laughs> oh, no, I'm not, I'm not a perpetual victim. A perpetual victim, I'm always a victim. I'm just, vic I'm, you know, I'm just, I'm no victim. I'm a victor. And don't worry, I'm getting back to my birth and everything else. But let me just also say this. Every day I wake up on Twitter and every, every, everything is, everyone is demanding their own day. You notice this? We have a day for this and a day for that and a day for, oh my gosh. Can we just do good and not demand a day? <laughs> Must we be applauded 24 hours a day for every kindness? My grandmother cared for 56 orphans as a single woman and didn't demand her own day. I'm just kind of tired of just the self-centeredness of the entire world. I'm just thinking to myself, can we just be good and be quiet about it? It'd be nice. Anyway, so my biological mother at 17, as I told you, went to Planned Parenthood. And they said, you're too young to have a baby. You need to go have a late-term saline abortion. A saline abortion is a saline salt solution that is injected into the mother's womb. The baby then gulps that solution. It is to burn and blind and suffocate the child. And then the baby is to be born dead within 24 hours, except something went terribly wrong. I was, in fact, born alive and not dead in an abortion clinic. Kind of a big deal. Not a hospital, an abortion clinic. 
not the friendliest of environments. And I always say, you don't want to mess with me because my father runs the world. And that father has been defending me from the very beginning. You <laughs> This is why I don't need to defend myself. He's, he's capable of it. He'll tend to me, he'll be okay, we'll be all right. Anyway, I was born at six o'clock in the morning, perfect moment, because the abortionist wasn't at work yet. Had he been there, he would have ended my life with, with strangulation, suffocation, or leaving me there to die. When, uh, when I was quite young, uh, just a baby, I was called a, as an e expert witness in a trial of an abortionist that had been caught strangling a baby that had survived its abortion. And in the trial, they wanted to prove that, this, that children do and have, in fact, survived. So they also called the abortionist to testify that that performed the abortion on my biological mother. And the reason I know this is because a reporter was there and a, the reporter came to me just a few years ago and said, we've met before. <laughs> I was at the trial and let me tell you about it. He said, Jonna, you were, <laughs> you were just young, but you were so alert <laughs> and you were staring at those abortionists. You were looking right at them. And he said, the abortionist that performed the abortion on your biological mother um, said, I had four survivors. I think he had more. These people are not in the habit of telling the truth. I had four survivors, and I was able to kill three of them. But I wasn't able to kill Jana. <laughs> he didn't know who he was trying to kill. He did not know. He knows now. <laughs> but you know, if he were here, I would tell him I forgive him. And if I were standing today and I weren't physically tired, I, I would say, sir, as I wouldn't normally ask a man to, to help steady me, I'd say, sir, can you give me your arm to help steady me? Bitterness is a really, really slow way to die while you're alive. You may want to let it go and give it to Jesus. Just something to think about. I know it's fashionable to be a victim and you get a lot of attention that way. But it's really annoying too. And it's no way to live. So it was six in the morning, as I told you, and so it gave a nurse time to call an ambulance and have me transferred to a hospital, and therefore she saved my life. I, I would be just absolutely dead and <laughs> finished off if it were not for Jesus and the nurse. I am alive by the sheer power of Jesus Christ. Did you hear his name? Jesus. Everyone online? Jesus. His name is Jesus. Nobody likes when you say his name anymore, unless he's a God that we create in our own image and he takes our commands. We don't mind him then. In fact, I think if, we, if he were here today, I think so many across the world would say, you don't even know what love is. No, we like to create our own Jesus instead of submit to the true one. But I can't even make my own heart beat. How can I be ashamed of the God who gave me life? You don't have to believe in him, but I will, be, I will stand before him and I will be held accountable for what I did or did not say on this earth. And if I go about and I ignore the gospel and just tell you a story. Then I have failed in my mission.
failed completely. Jesus is all. And you know, it's not all about someone having a fantastic story. Your story is fantastic. Do you know, the Lord freaked out on your birthday because he says he knew you before you were born, so he was just waiting, waiting for your day and that there will be no other you ever. No other you. So you may not feel extraordinary. You Maybe you do. I hope you do. But even if no one gives you praise, it doesn't matter. There will never be another you. So live well. Live beautifully. Oh. And see, with every life spared from abortion, generations are spared. Because think about how many children generally come from one person. So, okay, can you imagine? I mean, I always think that the baby 700 years, or the person 700 years from now thanks you for caring about the situation here today because they wouldn't be alive otherwise. Generations are spared or lost with abortion, whether the abortion takes place or not. Think of how many people we will never know. It's very sobering. And so the nurse called the ambulance at 6 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> and I was taken to the hospital, and they said, this kid's going to die. There is no way she's going to live. And then I kept living because I do not die. That is not what I do. <laughs> they said, this baby girl has a tremendous will to live. She doesn't want to die. I wish they said the same thing about Charlie Gard and Alfie Evans. Instead, we have judges that say there's no hope anyway. Oh, no, sir. There is always hope because there is a God whom you deny. Doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It does mean that these wicked men will stand before him. Strong words, I know. We need to handle a few strong words today because maybe we wouldn't be as tolerant of such evils if we could just listen for a moment to the truth. A lady walked up to me in Dublin yesterday in the middle of the street and said, if only you would come from a place of love, maybe someone would listen to you. <laughs> And I said, that is pure manipulation. Because you see, ladies and gentlemen, it's not that I don't love people. It's that I love people so much, and I love the children of Ireland so much that I am not willing to lie to you. I'm not willing to allow your nation to be comfortable with death. If I didn't love you, I wouldn't have come. So they said I, I had a strong will to live. Then I was placed in emergency foster care because my biological mother was not fit to care for me. And they decided that they didn't like me. <laughs> Are you noticing a theme? Ladies and gentlemen, from the very beginning to the present day, I've either been loved, hated, or misunderstood. It's okay. It's quite adventurous, really. 
but it's not easy and I didn't sign up for an easy life. I signed up for an extraordinary one. And so these morons didn't like me and uh, so the government took me out of that home and placed me in another home of a beautiful woman by the name of Penny. By this time, I was 17 months old. I was 32 pounds of dead weight and diagnosed with cerebral palsy, which was caused directly by a lack of oxygen to my brain while I was surviving an abortion. So I wouldn't be disabled had I not survived an abortion. Somehow though, I'm never invited to these women's marches. <laughs> Shocking. <laughs> With those beautiful hats. I'm kidding. It's absurd, it's ridiculous. Um, and you can imagine how I feel when I hear the argument, if the baby is disabled, we need to terminate the pregnancy. That sounds just like Adolf Hitler. Who are you healthy person to look at me and decide for me what my quality of life is? How arrogant. Don't you know that when you need Jesus, you get him? He's right there with you. And don't you know there's no more beautiful and wonderful life than that? And don't you know that there is such beauty in adversity? It's as if we've decided that we are superior to suffering of any kind. How dare we have to suffer at all? In fact, I heard this nurse telling this pregnant lady the other day on some dumb show, she said, no, don't you know, con she, she was, the woman was pregnant, don't you know contractions are painful? Really? Okay. And don't you know that she wanted natural childbirth, blah, blah, blah. I won't get into a debate about that. But she wanted this natural childbirth, blah, blah. Don't you know? And I'll never forget what she said to this, this woman who just wanted to have her baby the way she wanted to have her baby. She said, we cannot allow you to suffer. She's having a baby. <laughs> this is not a cakewalk. It's giving life. <laughs> we can't allow you to suffer. Really? Oh. So now we euthanize people instead? Is that merciful? So. I've been told by angry Irish women in the last 48 hours, that my story is irrelevant. Because we're not talking about 12 weeks, we're talking about seven and a half months, and that's ridiculous, and that would never, blah, blah, blah. really? Hmm. And somehow, a heartbeat at 16 days is not a life in their mind. And if they want to leave God out of it, which is ridiculous, but if they want to, just, just look at an ultrasound. It disproves all of their arguments. If we can do surgery in utero, how's that possible? If the baby is not a baby. So anyway, you know this. We all know this. People that are for abortion know this. We all know this because if we didn't know this, there wouldn't be such an epic spiritual battle in your nation right now. I landed in Dublin and you can feel it. The thirst for death. Coming, I mean, they just want death so much to come to your nation. They hunger and thirst for it. 
And if I were you, this might freak some of you out. It might be, I'm evangelical. It might be a little too charismatic for you. But I would just rebuke that in the name of Jesus. How's that online, people? You still with me? <laughs> Y'all need to lighten up a little online there. And we also, by the way, online, internet world, I think we need to learn how to disagree a little bit better. Are we adults or are we all five? Notice that the requirement is we must all think the same. We must all submit to one line of thinking, and that's it. Ooh, scary, scary times. No, no, no. No, it's not going to be me. Anyway. So I was diagnosed with CP as a result of, of this abortion, and every doctor looked at my penny and said, Gianna will never be anything. That's so nice. She's never going to progress beyond this way. She's never going to do anything but stay in a bed for the rest of her life. Can you imagine if my penny had believed them, my foster mother, if she had believed them? Instead, she didn't. And she did my physical therapy three times a day, and she prayed. Imagine that. The power of prayer. And I began to hold on my head. She did my physical therapy three times a day. Amazing. I began to hold on my head, sit up, crawl, and walk by the age of three and a half with a walker and leg braces. I would not be here today if it were not for Christ and the love of one woman who just believed in me when no one else did. And she gave me her heart, and her heart changed my life. And so, I won't be up here much longer. How are you? <laughs> you never know. I know how it can be. You're listening to people sometimes. They're going on and on. You're thinking, lady, I am done. I was done 15 minutes ago. <laughs> but, um... I was adopted at three and a half by my foster mother's daughter, which made my foster mother Penny, my grandmother, who became my queen. She was just fantastic. She died about four years ago. She was 91, having cared for 56 foster children as a single woman, as I told you earlier. Those doctors didn't know that I would be feisty. They didn't know that I would go on to, by the grace of God, <laughs> run two 26.2 two, uh, mile marathons by running on my toes for seven and eight hours. Now listen, I'm not an athlete. I think this is obvious. <laughs> I'm not going to make record time. This is not the point. The point is finishing. The point is vexing the devil. The point is just having so much fun because you're doing something that is just impossible. I don't know about you, but I didn't come to Christ so I could live some boring life and just talk about Jesus and how fantastic it would be if he would do something great and impossible for me. No, I want to know the Jesus that sets me free, and I want to know the God that says, for me, nothing is too difficult. And I just, I intend to bother him with my requests until he answers me because I think he likes my feistiness. In fact, I think he gave it to me. <laughs> and you know, you might be really offended by this because you might think, girl, where is your reverence? Where is your, <laughs> listen to me, people. The Lord is my only dad. I had a father for just a little while. My adoptive father was a brilliant architect <laughs> and also an enormous alcoholic. And by the grace of God, I was able to lead him to Christ two days before he died. So what I learned, ladies and gentlemen, is that he didn't adopt me so that he could be my dad, but so that I could lead him to his own, his own father, which is God. And you know, so that being the case, when your father and your mother forsake you, you know, the Lord will take you up. It says that in the Bible. 
So if God is my dad, then I speak to him as such, and I don't put on a performance for him. Because I don't think he's impressed by it anyway. And he's never shamed me for that. And you might think, well, good grief. Are you crazy? You think God speaks to you? You might want to read your Bible. It says, my sheep know my voice. And if you've never spoken to him, you might want to try it. And then you might want to listen. Because he'll speak back. And it is the coolest thing ever. And you may think I'm crazy. And I really don't care. Because I am living the impossible. Are you? So I dare you to just say something to God and ask him for the thing that you don't think he will do at all. And just keep asking. Pretend like you have cerebral palsy and you don't have a, a choice to quit. And see what happens in your life. Now, people always ask me, have you ever met your biological mother? Oh my gosh, have you ever met your biological mother? Was it just incredible? Were you just weeping? Was it just incredible? Was it awesome? Was it just amazing? Was it just, uh? And I don't mean to roll my eyes, but people are so dramatic. <laughs> speaking of the Lord speaking, so I was on an airplane once, and since I'm always on them, God will often speak to me on them <laughs> because you're just sitting quietly doing nothing except listening to the loud eater next to you. <laughs> loud eaters, oh. They are my sanctification process. <laughs> People eating like Lay's potato chips, chomping them from across, and you can hear it from miles away. Anyway, this is off topic. Um, <laughs> so um, I was on a plane. And I heard this voice in my heart say, Jonah, what would you do if your biological mother came to an event? And what would you say? And what would you do if this happened? And how about this? And what if this happened? And how about this? And it was like, I mean, it was like I was on trial. And I was, I'm, I'm answering all these questions. And OK, I would do this. And if this happened, and if she interrupted it, I would do this. Now, the Lord is such a great father. He doesn't always say, oh, and by the way, this is about to occur in two weeks, so you can freak out. <laughs> no. No, but he prepares you anyway, right? So I was like this, uh, doing an event, and I was greeting everyone, all the healthy people without colds. And, um, <laughs> and a woman came up, and she said, hi, I'm your mother. And there was no warning except for the voice in my heart on the plane two weeks prior. Can you imagine if I just kind of blew that off? So to myself, I just said, Jesus, 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 Jesus. Help me, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. Because it felt like the universe was just crushing me. But my battle has never get been against people. And it was not against her. I'm in a spiritual battle. And by the way, in every audience I speak to, there are women that have had abortions, sometimes several of them, several abortions. Uh, men men who've, who've been involved with abortions that, that they're, they're, in fact, our taxi driver yesterday said my uh, ex-wife aborted our fifth child. 17 years ago, and you're the first person I've told. And then he said he was an atheist, and I said, oh, not for long, dude. <laughs> I said, you have met your match. I said, this time next year, you'll be a Christian. No, 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 no. Oh, yes, you will. Mm -hmm. Jesus totally has got you. Oh, he's so got you. It was so much fun. But it was also such an honor that he would to just you know, let me into his story. And um, I know I was telling you about my biological mother, but there was a reason I went off on this particular tangent. Hopefully it will come back. Um, so back to her, though. 
Oh, yes, this is what I was j about to say. Um, especially also women listening online. Maybe some of the most angry women listening online. And even in the room, I'm not here to condemn you. I'm not here to condemn the, the, the women of Ireland at all. Um, or anywhere. I'm simply here to tell you the truth. And then you do with it what you want. You don't have to listen to me at all. You can dismiss me, and many do. But you can never say that no one told you the truth. Ever again. So my biological mother came up and said, hi, I'm your mother. And I said, ma'am, I'm a Christian, and I forgive you. She said, I don't want your forgiveness. Because ladies and gentlemen, if she received my forgiveness, she'd have to ad admit what she'd done. And that she found absolutely unbearable. I said, ma'am, I'm a Christian and I forgive you. I don't want your forgiveness. Your father is this, and you are this, and you are an embarrassment to this family. You see, she didn't want me telling the truth to anyone. She didn't like a couple things, I think, that I had the audacity to live and remind her of what she'd done. And she didn't like that I come from a different kingdom. I belong to Jesus. And that's a kingdom of light. And darkness can't stand that. So I said, ma'am, I'm a Christian, and I forgive you a third time. But I will no longer allow you to speak to me in this manner. And I got up and I walked out. And then I cried for three hours and freaked out. Total meltdown. Because I'm a girl, whatever. We freak out and then, you know, we're fine. Um, all this to say, and this is my conclusion, you may come from a horrendous background, but you don't need to be defined by that background. The thing she couldn't stand is that she had no control over me. And now, instead of repeating generational sin and mistakes, by the grace of God, I'm changing generations. You can do the same. Young men in the room, all men in the room, you are made to be men of honor. And I'm calling you to that today. You are born to defend women and children, not use us and walk away. If you have a teenage daughter at home, defend her. Don't let her walk out the door with half her clothes on because you are the only man standing between her and a vicious world who is waiting to just destroy her. Don't you want her to look at you on her wedding day and say, thank you, Dad. Thank you that when I thought I was all grown up, you decided not to be a passive man, but you decided to be my dad and protect me. So if you don't want your homes to fall apart, your nation to fall apart, then, then you stand up and take it back. Because you've got some awesome women who are ready to partner with you, but we are not the same as men, and we are not made to do your job. Oh, the feminists are freaking out now. <laughs> <laughs> Do 
But young men, if you didn't have a dad at home that told you how to be a man, a man of honor, then go and find a man of honor and ask him to teach you how to be one and then change everyone in your sphere of influence because you actually have courage that they don't yet possess and you can be an example for them. And by the way, it's not normal for you to be addicted to pornography. That addiction will blind you. You will not be able to see women as you ought to see us. So I'm about to say a very unpopular word. Repent. Just turn away from it. Ask Jesus to forgive you. If you're that type of man, guess what? You don't have to be that type of man anymore. If you've never been a man of honor, maybe you've been one of the most vile of men, just give your, your heart to Christ. Repent of those things and become, let him transform you into a man of honor. And by the way, girls, I'm not finished. Girls, you don't need to be chasing those boys. They need to be chasing you. You are made to be chased. We are made to be adored. We are made to just know that we are loved. And by the way, if you didn't have a father, guess what? You can never receive from a man what you should have received from your father. You do not need to be dating right now if your heart is broken from being fatherless. It is not going to happen. It is never going to work. The only one that can heal your heart from that, and I can tell you this from experience, is Jesus and you might think to yourself, you might be sitting here and all antsy and thinking to yourself, what does this have to do with our referendum? It has everything to do with your referendum. You've got women throwing themselves away because they have no fathers. They have no respect for men because their own father had no respect for them. Some of the most angry women I've ever known are most angry with their father who never came through. Do you see how important you are? So girls, you are worthy of, of being pursued. And, and I just wanted to let you know that and let you know that you need to heal before you date. Huh? I don't know if I forgot anything. Oh, yes, I did. <laughs> For everyone listening here and also online, just imagine if uh, your grandfather had been aborted. <coughs> That'd be kind of a big deal. The whole room would not be here. It's easy to talk about abortion in terms of right, re really impersonal, until we... We, we use emotion to, until emotion is used to manipulate the masses into murdering their children. How dare you use that language? So easy to speak about abortion in terms of rights. Just speak about it as it is. It's not a right. It's just killing children. And you know that. I'm not telling you something you don't know. So thank you for having me in your beautiful country. And I, I really hope, I really hope I really hope the children of Ireland are delivered from evil. That's all.